routinely. You see them occurring around property rights and contracts. Uh, more of one, less of the other, equal? <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough question. But, but I think um, um, it's fair to say that in India, uh, the, the big guys have an advantage <laughs> because uh, they are close to decision making in a way that the small guy isn't. So I think that's a structural problem in India. Uh, so, so even as you see movement going forward, I think it's the big guys that who, who would be probably the first and primary beneficiaries. So then referring back to the slide of yours where you have the, the um, um, uh, um, a taxonomy, I think it was, yes. uh, uh, policies, yeah. Yeah. am I right in reading it uh, as essentially saying that, that it could in fact be helpful to short to medium term growth in India uh, to have uh, better recognition of property and contract and resort to judicial procedures to enforce them? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I, I think uh, uh, bureaucratic delays, corruption affect the small man more than uh, the small company more than the big company. Uh, and certainly improving those would help the small firms. But, but those are not easily done. That's yes. the problem. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, Thank you. Uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, just given the shortness of time, these are focused questions, but I invite all, everybody, of course, to, to contribute uh, in the post-hearing to, to, uh, to everyone's thinking in this area on any side of the issues. Uh, let me ask another direct uh, question, if I, if I could, to Mr. Schlesinger. Uh, um, you, you mentioned um, uh, the idea of, of uh, using, um, well, essentially treating software piracy as tax evasion. Um, can, can you say a little bit more now or later in the post hearing um, about uh, how this approach has been used uh, in other places than India? Uh, has it been successful? What are its features and flaws? Um, uh, does it, in fact, have an effect on software piracy? Does it have an effect on access to software, et cetera? Well, thank you very much for the question. And just to reiterate what several of the other panelists have said about um, software piracy, as you know, in 2011, the last year that um, the industry has um, put together the statistics on uh, software, unauthorized use of software in businesses were at 63% with the value of unlicensed software at $2.9 billion. Um, so yes, in fact, um, one of the recommendations is that the Indian government amend its tax laws to classify software piracy as a form of tax evasion because those who use software without authorization are profiting from this um, activity. Uh, in their, you know, otherwise legitimate business practices. Um, by doing this, and this is in line with international best practices, and I will get you in the um, post-hearing in written submission some other examples of um, where this international best practice has been used. But it would provide tax inspectors and internal and, and external auditors with the power to check and account for genuine software licenses inside both the SOE and government um, corporations and also in, in private industry. Uh, and it would allow the recovery of hundreds of millions of dollars in loss direct and indirect taxes. Um, and just to, to note one other recommendation, which is to amend the Companies Act um, to require software compliance audits by um, qualified and appointed auditors. Uh, we think that requirements might be targeted by reference to minimum thresholds, for example, the total revenue, total assets of a company, to determine the set of companies uh, for which such an audit requirement would, ap would apply. But, you know, this is the, the whole idea here is that good corporate citizens who properly uh, procure and properly purchase their hardware should also um, be made to properly purchase so, their software. Yeah, and again, I'm just mindful of the time, and we're certainly very, um, very much benefit from you know reading the submission. So, so maybe in the post hearing, if you could um, say a little bit more about uh, who else has tried this and has it worked, and what are the uh, other effects of it. Just not for now, but 
but for later, that would really help. Absolutely, <coughs> thank you very much. And then, uh, uh, always, always a pleasure to uh, 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 engage in an academic conversation with another academic. I, uh, 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 um, uh, so, so if I, if I could, uh, uh, Professor Raghavan, uh, you talked a, about uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the kind of compulsory licensing approach in India, and I would probably, uh, again, given the shortness of time, we may not be able to have a fulsome dialogue about it here, but I would love it if you could, in the post-hearing or later, uh, provide some discussion about, number one, um, do you think that uh, uh, the uh, TRIPS uh, uh, article that you're relying on uh, has any requirement in it for the compulsory license to occur on uh, commercially uh, reasonable terms and conditions, what those would be, uh, and you know how we would think about that, and 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 again the others might might weigh in on that as well. And then the the follow up would be just to uh, uh, it's always noticeable, Dr. Dr. Chakrabarty, who of course is both American and Indian and so well known for having uh, made his way to the Supreme Court in the U.S., uh, has been so outspoken about the importance of intellectual property rights in a way that seems to be so misguided given your testimony. And I ho hope you could explain in connection with his writings why he's wrong uh, uh, in the fall. Uh, uh, or, or, uh, and of course we would invite others to explain why he's not so wrong. Uh, but just so that we could have a, a dialogue about it, an, an Indian American uh, who has uh, skin in the game in the space. Uh, so thanks so much. Thank you. Um, Professor Keith has put it so much better than I can, because I was about to ask uh, Professor Flynn about his comments about intellectual property rights out. I don't remember the exact word, not being of much value to developing countries. So it's something along those lines. So maybe I would, and I heard another witness earlier talked about WIPO doing studies of countries about, I guess you might say the value of their intellectual property assets and getting countries to appreciate that. Which does imply that intellectual property in developing countries can be a, can contribute to economic development. So I just, maybe, I don't know if, if Professor Perrin, Professor Brogdon can bring, briefly maybe just clarify if I understood them correctly or about the importance of intellectual property and development. This is in fact the India. So the, so the literature, the literature on this issue is nuanced. And, you know, I think, I think to paint with a broad brush, um, that uh, the economic literature shows that intellectual property has both costs and benefits. The, the costs are both on the administration side, you know, the, the cost of actually setting up uh, administrative structures to grant and enforce intellectual property rights is not negligible. Um, and then the costs are on the excessive pricing side. You know, this is where some of my work is done, but in, in the, the work the economic literature shows that monopolies, however granted, um, in countries with very high income inequality, uh, forces greater deadweight loss than in countries with less income inequality. So, you know, some of our models show that in the United States, you know, the deadweight loss would be about 50% of the economy on a, on a good that was equally consumed by all segments of the economy, as something like the medicine usually are. Um, but where in countries with higher income inequality, the deadweight loss can be up to 90, 95, or 99 percent of the country would be priced out through the profit okay. maximization. Well, it's, it's that monopolization, right? So that so that requires policy response on the side on the side of the developing countries. They need to do something about that problem, or they won't enjoy the benefits of the products. Now the now what they do about it, there's there's different ways that they can control for that problem. You know, so one of them is through a compulsory license, and this gets to uh, Professor Keith's question. You know, what is a, what is a commercially, uh, or what does a reasonable uh, compulsory license look like if you accept that problem at its fact? Um, that you have to do something, that one of the TRIPS compliant measures is to give a compulsory license. And then, so what should the royalty look like? What should the license look like, et cetera? But if your, if your royalty 
is a lost profit rationale. It gives you everything you would have lost at that at that price. Then you will lose the benefits. So you know, by definition, if you're going to use compulsory licenses to improve access to medicines, that royalty will not make up for the lost profits that you would have made up otherwise um, at monopoly pricing. That good. The qualification help a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Don't worry. Uh, uh, Mangalawi, Mangalawi. Yeah. I, I, I do have the rest. How about that? <laughs> just, I just want to throw one uh, important consideration here. You know, uh, while I agree with, uh, with a lot of what Professor Flynn and Professor Radwan said, uh, I think the spirit of the TRIPS agreement, I don't think you can look at this uh, just from the perspective of whether IP is good or bad for yeah. India's development. I think it's part of the political compromise of the TRIPS agreement that large, especially large emerging market countries, I think committed to contributing to some fair share of the global, of the fixed cost of global R&D. So I, I think they have a, a, a responsibility there as well. Uh, and I think it's balancing that against providing affordable access is what makes this a very difficult question. So I don't think any Indian policymaker would say, oh, it's all about what it does for India. I, I think there is an understanding that, you know, India, because it's a big economy, it may be poor, but it's very big. And especially going forward, that's going to change. So India also has to contribute some, some amount, some fair share of global R&D. So I think you should keep that perspective in mind. And, but what the fair share should be, that's, of course, the million dollar question. Mr. I, okay. Um, I want to go back, thank you, I, I want to go back to the question of uh, IP and development, uh, but really talk about it from the United States, really, just to give a comparative perspective, right? If we look at the, how IP is contributed, and if we look at each sector, right, from, from biotechnology, and I, I, I want to allude back to uh, Chakravarti. Chakravarti opened up biotechnology sector in the United States like no other, uh, you know, um, and nothing else could do. It's brought biotechnology investments, right? But and from that time, from 1980 to today, today the debate is whether we are issuing too many secondary patents. How does it affect basic research? And what kind of problems are United States is facing? Because too many patents does not immediately mean too much innovation. It probably is stifling basic research, right? And, and so much so that it, it's causing the Supreme Court to intervene at every possible opportunity. So there lies our spectrum. Patents is good, the, and that's the balance that Justice Stevens talked about, overprotection, the balance between overprotection and underprotection, right? And for a country like India with other de <laughs> developmental issues here, right, like welfare and socioeconomic and other issues, you know, that balance is not easy to achieve. Right, and so um, you know, and that spectrum has to has to be looked at from that paradigm as well. And so that's you know uh, one of the things I want to. That's that's our time. Sean, uh, just a very brief comment to put this in perspective. That uh, after the grant of compulsory license, where sales of Nexa were in India is doubled, and in our return submission, will produce that data, uh, confirming that uh, Bayer has been able to double its sales. One other quick observation about the TRIPS agreement. Yes, the developing world accepted intellectual property rights regime in return for and this is where Article 7 and 8 of the TRIPS Agreement, enabling transfer of technology <coughs> to the developing world. And what has been happening even earlier discussion today, that this transfer of technology to the developing countries, including India, has been lagging behind. So why, whereas, onus of uh, honoring those agreements, lies with the developing world, but in return, the onus which the developed world had accepted has not been maintained. Thank you. Yes, very briefly, just to follow up on the WIPO, I will provide, by the way, the WIPO's 
2013 assessment of all the studies that they've done calculating the contribution of copyright to 40 countries' economies. They've got 10 more in the pipeline. Um, and just to note that when you look at the facts, when you look at the data, it's not. It, there may be reasons that a country like Ukraine, their the contribution of their copyright industries to the Ukrainian economy is much much lower in the two to three percent range than, say, on the other end of the spectrum, the United States or Australia, where the contribution of copyright to the U.S. economy is around, or the Australian economy is around 11 percent. And just to note that I believe that India, with all due respect, is hiding its head in the sand on this issue because they could ask WIPO to conduct a study so they would have the same facts and figures and a way forward with reproducible data. They have yet to ask WIPO to conduct the study. Great, thank you. And Mr. Edson? So I think an important point to be made about the compulsory licensing discussion is that if you go back to the 2001 Doha Declaration on Trips and Public Health, it affirmed the right of countries to issue compulsory licenses in, quote, extraordinary situations of extreme urgency or other national emergency to address legitimate public health needs. So I, need to, I think we need to ask ourselves, is a situation where a country is issuing a compulsory license on a drug like Nexavar, which is an anti-leukemia drug, which, Mark, I think you said uh, affects a, a, a number of citizens in the tens of thousands, if that's justified, then is it justified for a country to issue a compulsory license on either type of cancer drug on an Alzheimer's disease? So there's a very important precedent here uh, that's, that, that's important uh, because it has large global implications. And I think that speaks to a broader point that while access to medicines is vitally important, so in the first place is existence of medicines. And Bayer does not charge a large price for Nexavar because it just wants to. It does so because, or it, prices are high because it costs up to $15 billion to de develop these types of biological drugs. And if we're going to have a global situation in which we can have solutions to future diseases that there aren't currently drugs to solve for, whether they affect American or Indian citizens, we have to allow innovative biopharmaceutical industries to earn a fair return on their innovations. They can follow us back in the Commission of Innovation. I'm call a time out on this issue because my time has just run out. And in a sense, we're not going to be able to resolve it in this study because we really are looking at economic impacts. And having been chairman of the Section 301 Committee at USTR for five years, I know the difference between the law and trying to figure out the economic impact. So if you want to make some comments post-hearing, uh, but otherwise, I'm sorry, otherwise you won't get to the others. And at this point, I'll turn to Commissioner Aronoff. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Welcome to all of today's witnesses. Um, I'm going to direct my first question. Um, uh, I'm going to start by asking it to Mr. Palmer, but then anyone else who wants to ask, please jump in. Um, are you aware of any industries in India that desire greater access to U.S. products or inputs or would like to see but are not receiving U.S. direct investment? And do those companies uh, attempt to have any leverage with the government in India in terms of opening the market? It's a good question that fortunately I can't answer because I don't, I don't know the answer on that, but uh, I welcome others to comment. Does anyone else have thoughts on that? Oh, I stumped the whole panel. <laughs> you did. It's the sort of thing we, we can look at and address in a subsequent submission. All right, if anyone wants to address that here, please feel free. I think oh, Mr. Key. Ezel, all the way in the back, is raising his hand, and I couldn't see it behind someone's head. Go ahead. If I might just make a general point, when you look at the level of foreign direct investment in India, it declined 13.5% between 2011 and 2012. And you saw at the announcement of the PN, uh, you know, a certain reticence of certainly ICT companies, you know, to invest in India. And I think the general point is, is that they want to. Um, especially now, if you look at the innovation reference policies of a country like China, uh, global ICT firms are looking for attractive environments in which to invest. They want to invest in India. They just want to do so under terms where they're not being compelled to by structures like the PMA, which mandates you know, the certain domestic production. Okay. All right. Um, Mr. Rao, why don't you go ahead? My next question was for you anyway. <laughs> well, I think right now the, the industry in India which is most desirous of greater opening up is the insurance industry. 
because they're undercapitalized and they need foreign investment in order to grow. And they're stuck right now at a 26% ceiling on foreign investment, and they would like for it to go up to 49. And practically everybody's agreed that it should go up to 49. It's just that our parliament is not able to say so formally. So somehow that's got to get resolved over the next 12 months, one way or the other. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Let me ask you the next question that I had for you anyway. Um, our preliminary staff research indicates that U.S. IT services providers face few, if any, barriers in the Indian market. Um, how has India's liberal trade regime and the participation of foreign firms in this industry impacted India's domestic IT industry? That is easily one of the most important questions because when people like us make a pitch for free trade, we want to point out that the first industry in India which became world class was IT. And it was the first industry which always pitched for free trade. So if you want to be world class, you want to pitch for free trade in your own interests. The idea that an industry should lobby for protection is a very short-term benefit. And I think this is something that we've got. I mean, uh, I have lost uh, <coughs> RFPs in India when I was running an Indian company to IBM. Um, and that's fine. You know, that in the, you know, this was for maintenance of a large Indian telecom provider. And so that means I have to get good. And that this has been really one of the success stories. It's almost as if it's a free trade 101 case to be made that every Indian industry should be lobbying for greater openness and transparency. It'll become world class eventually. Uh, you asked how specifically it happened and, and uh, you know how free trade had. The big change that happened was in the mid-80s, India allowed computers to come in, the hardware, and that was the first transformational step. The second, uh, which kind of speaks to the last point that Mr. Rao made, is that the fact that you had so many Indians working here uh, uh, in, in California and Silicon Valley, etc., that's what allowed Indians to gain a reputation that then got them the contracts that then powered the IT services. So it's a great example of you know, getting, peop uh, getting computers in and the U.S. accepting Indians overseas that transform the IT industry. Can, can that model be replicated? Are there specific <coughs> sectors where that model would be easily replicated? Actually, biotech, biotech should be a, a very similar area because it's high intellectual, intellectual content. And, and there's a fair amount of labor and biotech research and so on. It's, it's not taken off as we thought it would uh, 10 years ago. Most of us thought biotech would be the next IT. It's not taken off exactly like that. And uh, you know, it could be for a variety of reasons. Okay. Mr. Shah, do you want to say something? This is happening in the pharmaceutical. <coughs> as of today, most of the American companies have collaborated uh, and form joint ventures with the Indian generic companies for doing original research, for marketing, for co-marketing their patented products. And this trend is moving fast. And uh, I must uh, mention, currently, uh, US FDA commissioner is in India, while I'm talking this, for 10 days. And uh, as you know, India supplies almost 30% of generic medicines to the United States. Uh, and she's there with her full staff, spending 10 days uh, exploring uh, how to collaborate and cooperate with Indian regulator and the Indian pharmaceutical industry. So this is already happening in the <coughs> And same company, Merck, Abbott, Gilead, Bayer, 
to form joint ventures with local Indian companies. Can I just add to that? Um, I would also add that India is also facilitating it. If you look at what India had um, before 2003, the drug price control order, which controlled the price of pharmaceuticals. Now, that the number of pharmaceuticals that was controlled has been increasingly decreasing, right? So even for, uh, at, there was a point in time, even local, locally manufactured drugs were subject to price control. And they have this complicated MAP formula, which was based on sales, et cetera, and cost of production, and um, the price would be negotiated with the government. So that price control regime, actually since 2003, has been, it, it, India itself is breaking it down as one of its efforts to in, improve the biotechnology uh, sectors. And that's, a, you know, a, a, that's <coughs> another show, uh, th that's another step towards liberalizing biotechnology sector. But of course, that, you know, that cannot be at the cost of access, right? You know, somebody was just saying it's important to innovate. Uh, and yes, it's important to innovate, but at the end of the day, we are innovating for people, right? So you have to ensure that uh, people have some access, especially in a country with the kind of population and welfare issues that India has. So. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Shah, let me ask you one other question. Um, we had a lot of discussion today, and in fact, the chairman has called a timeout on discussion about um, <laughs> uh, certain uh, IP-related uh, things that have occurred in India that affect U.S. companies. Um, but I wanted to ask, with respect to your Indian company membership, um, have any of your members experienced <coughs> denials or revocations of biopharmaceutical patents uh, in India or in other markets? Um, or had their products compulsory licensed? Uh, we are experiencing different type of problem. Uh, we ventured into original research as late as 2000. So we have only a history of about 12 years now. But within this 12 year period, at least three original research products have been commercialized in India. And these companies are now trying to launch these products in the developed world. But our biggest hurdle is, and this is where the frustration of uh, most American companies come in, is regulatory regime. Uh, equivalent of our uh, US FDA setup. That has not kept pace with the changes that have taken place. And that is where uh, the government of India is working closely with the US government to upgrade its regulatory setup. Our experience has been that the first original research product, just giving you one example, if one were to apply to US FDA for a phase one trial, 30 days, if it is not approved, it's considered as a deemed approved, and company can start the phase one trial. When an Indian company applied with the Indian regulator for this approval, 18 months of his patent life was lost because Indian regulator did not know how to evaluate the results of phase one trial. So the problem are not of policies. Intentions are clear, it's the capacity. And unless this capacity building takes place, which has progressed significantly, this I'm talking about what happened five years ago. This has progressed significantly, and India has been sending <coughs> officials from the drug regulatory department to the US FDA here for training and is working closely with the US FDA regulator uh, to train its own personnel. Thank you. Thank you very much. My time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going back to you, Professor Raghavan. Uh, would you uh, agree with the notion that this compulsory licensing issue um, is uh, an issue of how you allocate R&D costs between developed and developing countries? Is that the issue? Um, no, the compulsory licensing issue is um, essentially is an issue of access um, and is an issue of access because in some countries, including India, labor is an important form of capital. 
and access to medication is important <coughs> to sustain that capital and improve productivity of the country. So, um, and, and from that perspective, compulsory licensing is legally allowed under the TRIPS agreement.